I made my way to a large museum, outside which was a tank which all good well, the Challenger. Apparently it's been filled with concrete to protect it from the local scallywags. As you can see, the building dates from a time when architects thought that making buildings look nice was a good idea. I'm at the Discovery Museum in Newcastle and I'm standing in front of an extremely important exhibit, the Turbinia, and I'm going to tell you all about it in this video which has been sponsored by World of Warships, but more of that later. Now the Turbinia is a contender for the most important historical ship ever because it revolutionized ship design, it revolutionized naval warfare, and by a rather indirect means, it revolutionized power generation the world over. Now, the Turbinia is called that because it's driven by a steam turbine engine, and it was the first ship uh, to be so powered. Now, steam engines, of course, had been around for well over a century before this. Uh, in fact, there was one even invented by the ancient Greeks, but, but never mind, that was never used to power anything useful. Um, but the Turbinia used a steam turbine, which is different from a, a, what had previously been a conventional steam engine. Now, in a conventional steam engine, you have a cylinder, and the pressure in the cylinder gets very high because of all the steam, and the piston gets pushed out the end. And then, when the pressure drops in the piston, it gets sucked back in again, and it goes up and down and up and down. And that up and down movement has to be translated into a rotational movement. And, of course, uh, the piston goes up, then it has to come to a halt, and then, it, then it goes all the way down. But in a steam turbine, it's enormously more efficient because you have a tube with a turbine in it, like lots of propellers, looks a bit like a modern jet engine, if you could imagine that, and that's constantly rotating. So the motion doesn't have to be translated into rotational uh, movement, it already is rotational movement. And the, um, the, the rotors on this are actually directly driven, didn't even go through a gearbox, it just went from power to propeller directly. Uh, and nothing has to come to a halt and then change direction. So this was, for its time, enormously more efficient. It was almost 12% efficient, which doesn't sound very much, but believe me, by the standards of the time, that was pretty amazing. And this was fast. This was amazingly fast. This was like three times faster than the, than the fast battleships of the day. This was about double the speed of the fastest thing that the Navy had before this came onto the water. But People didn't really know about it, and some people were a little bit cynical, but the Admiralty had been alerted. Charles uh, Parsons got some people from the Admiralty to come up to Newcastle and have a look at it. But they weren't initially immediately convinced, perhaps, but he was able to convince the world in 1897. It was the occasion of the Diamond Jubilee of Queen Victoria. She was actually too ill to attend, but she sent her son, the Prince of Wales. And there were loads of local dignitaries, all the lords of the Ad Admiralty, and there were lots of foreign dignitaries as well watching, which I'm sure was significant, and of course, vast crowds who had come along to say things like, hooray, uh, there were bands playing and, and there was ice cream. So, can you imagine then how magnificent the whole fleet bedecked in all their wonderful flags looked? And all the people were saying hooray terribly well because people were good at saying hooray in those days. And as they sailed by, this suddenly appeared. And it just went straight through the fleet at, frankly, an embarrassing speed. A lot of people were you know, getting a bit sheepish because it really was very fast. You couldn't not notice something going three times the speed of everything else. Uh, apparently, in some versions of the story, uh, a ship was sent out to, to shepherd it and say, uh, excuse me, could you stop doing that? And this went straight at it and uh, scared the, the crewmen on board that they thought, we're going to have to abandon ship. There was a lieutenant standing on the stern of the ship who was in the action of unbuckling his, his saber, thinking we're going to have to dive overboard here. But this thing was fast and maneuverable, little uh, hand on the tiller, and it shot past uh, the stern, missing by a very short amount. And uh, history records that uh, the lieutenant and one of the crewmen on the Turbinia exchanged words. But uh, because everything was so noisy, neither he heard what the other one said, which was probably just as well. Um, Anyway, uh, an enormous wake crashed against that little boat, uh, embarrassing it somewhat. So the, the Navy looked a little bit, uh, a little bit uh, wet and slow when next to this sleek 104 foot by nine foot across, um, and I'll show you the, 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 the bow in a moment, it's really, really sharp. This was like a speedboat. This was so fast that as it was accelerating, the bow actually came out of the water. It's 104 feet long. Just think how powerful you have to be to get the bow actually out of the water. This thing was so fast that it was difficult for the stokers to shovel the coal in fast enough to keep it up at high revs, to keep the speed up. This thing was so fast that it was frankly embarrassing. And everyone realized very quickly, oh, this is the future. This is how naval warfare is going to happen. Ships are going to be powered by these because a navy that has ships that can go two or three times the speed of any of its rivals, well, it's just going to win. Its fleets can't be caught. So this is a significant ship.
Now, Charles Algernon Parsons was an extraordinary fellow. For a kickoff, he was the son of an earl. He was also homeschooled. And after going to university, he served an apprenticeship at uh, Armstrong, later to become Vickers Armstrong, the famous gun manufacturers up here in the Northeast. Uh, so he wasn't afraid to get his hands dirty. Later in life, he, uh, he turned his uh, hand to, to other forms of science. And he became, for instance, uh, quite a renowned astronomer. And he bought a telescope factory and built a lot of the, the world's big telescopes. Uh, and at one point, he was president of the Royal Society, no less. So he was definitely a man of science. And though the steam turbine was an idea that had been around for a century, he was the first person to get one that was practical, that actually worked. And he did this by a lot of research and development, loads and loads of tiny incremental improvements until eventually he got it to work. Um, now, when he designed this, however, he'd never built a ship before, but he thought, do you know, this steam turbine has a very definite application aboard a ship. It would be great aboard a ship. I need to build a ship to demonstrate it. He'd never built a ship before, but yeah, that didn't stop him. He was Victorian. Nothing stopped these people. How difficult could building a ship be? Well, he designed a ship, and it turned out to be rather a good design. And one year later, he had the ship. That's amazingly quickly. And the people who built the ship were a local sheet metal working firm. They'd never built a ship either. But how difficult can it be? Well, not all that difficult, it seems. This is the ship as it has been restored in its 1897 Spithead Review configuration. And you'll see that it has unusually three shafts with three screws on. Some people call them propellers, but I believe that a naval man would call them screws. And this was the configuration that eventually gave him the performance that his calculations had led him to expect. His early attempts uh, were somewhat disappointing. At first, he had just the one central shaft, and he got all sorts of problems with it. The screws were slipping on the shaft, and he wasn't getting the, uh, the efficiency. He tried again and again with all sorts of different configurations and different designs of screw, and eventually he got this configuration that satisfied him. And this is the one that went to spit head. Um, but he had to overcome a new problem. He had this funny, loud, fizzling, crackling noises and, and weird trails of bubbles. And he was getting lots of cavities appearing on, on the back edges of, of the screws. What was this? It was a new thing. It was a new thing which was created by the astonishing new speed that it was possible to achieve with the steam turbine. It was called cavitation. What is cavitation? Well, cavitation uh, is named after the word cavity, and there are cavities appearing on the back edges of the propeller, and there are also cavities appearing in the water. Now, you see, I want you to imagine there's a bit of water here, minding its own business, there's a bit of water here, and they're, they're perfectly happy being bits of water, until someone comes along with a really fast boat, and the blade of a propeller, or a screw, comes between them like that, boom, really, really fast. So, because of the angle on it, this bit of water is suddenly shoved that way, really, really fast. And the bit of water that was further that way, it thinks, oh, blimey, I'm under a huge amount of pressure here, but I'm water, so I'm not really very compressible, so I'm going to resist, and you push back. So you've got a high-pressure area on this side of the blade, uh, and, of course, the reaction to this is it pushes against the blade, which is attached to the ship, and so the ship goes that way, which is fine. That's what you want. But let's think about the poor bit of water on the other side. This bit of water has suddenly lost all its support on that side, and it sort of goes, Bleh. it finds itself in a very low pressure volume. And because the pressure is so low, cavities form in the water of gas, because the pressure goes actually below the point uh, of the pressure of water vapor in the water. Another way of putting this is to say that the water boils. But the trouble is that people think of, of water boiling as being the, the result of heat. It's not that the propeller, though it does very, very slightly, heats up the water. It's that it lowers the pressure of the water. Now, uh, you're an educated person, so you probably know that the higher up a mountain you go, the easier it is to boil water as the pressure goes down. And if you go up into space and opened your eyes, uh, the, the water on the, on the outside of your eyes would immediately boil off because it's so easy to boil water at low pressures. Um, now, I want you to imagine that this is a much higher budget video than in fact it is, and that I was able to build a huge ball pit, you know, full of those hollow, brightly colored spheres that children play with. So there I am, down, buried in a lot of those very light plastic balls. And because they're all in contact with each other, they behave a little bit like a liquid. You know, it's possible to, after fashion, swim through a ball pit, isn't it? You know, once you've fished out all the toddlers. Well, think how much energy I have to put in to go ha like that and throw off the balls and stand up. And some of those balls will fly up into the air, no longer be in contact with their fellows. And so they will be behaving like particles of gas, not liquid. Now, it's very easy for me to do that because I wasn't under much pressure. But imagine that those balls are made out of wood or even worse, steel. I'm then under a huge amount more pressure. So 
I just struggle to, to uh, rise to my feet and they behave more like a liquid. They're not thrown up into the air. It takes up huge, much more energy to throw things up into the air when the pressure is very high. So if you can lower the pressure of water enormously, it takes very little energy for something to become gas. And right on the back of the propeller, the, the pressure gets so low that little bubbles of gas form. And Charles Parsons observed this. It was a new phenomenon and he photographed it. He built a, a machine for observing it and photographing it. Yes, these were the late 1890s, but you know, he had the technology and he was using the latest stuff. And he, he, he uh, I believe it was him who actually coined the term cavitation. Cavities, he was actually talking about cavities in the water rather than the cavities on the back of the propeller, but um, it's all part of the same process. So this little uh, bubble forms on the back of, of the propeller. Um, Bubbles tend to form on things like a little impurity in the water, a little dust or something, or the back of a, a, a surface of something solid like the propeller. And it forms, so you've got a dome on the back of the propeller, but it doesn't last very long, it collapses. And as it collapses, rather than shrinking gently the way it came, it, uh, nature, it seems, takes the shortest path. And so we believe that they collapse like that, bam, through the middle. And this weight of water here uh, actually hits the back of the propeller with such force that it actually can dent uh, and even rip bits out of the metal. And uh, this is not just inefficient, it also damages your, your screw. So after a while, you have to replace it. Um, he was eventually able to solve the problem by a variety of means, including redesigning the screws, changing the angle of them, and eventually tailoring them uh, so that they didn't come up with cavitation. Cavitation today is a problem uh, in submarines because submarines want to be stealthy and so you don't want to make lots of noise and cavitation, uh, the, the, the destruction of those little bubbles makes a, a loud crackling noise. And of course you also don't want to be seen and a trail of bubbles uh, caused by ca cavitation is also something that, that a, a, a submarine doesn't want. And so they have um, many bladed screws with uh, a quite a, a gentle turn on them. So they don't uh, get so much speed, unfortunately. They sacrifice speed for stealth. But there you go, everything's a compromise. These are some of the screws that Charles Parsons experimented with, varying the pitch and area of the blades. Hmm, there's an unusual one. This is a clever thing. He built this device which has powerful springs in it to measure the torsion in the shafts. It told him that the turbines and shafts were working fine and that the problem lay with translating this power to the screws and water. Here is one of the models used when designing the turbinia. A crank, you see, winds up rubber cords, which then turn gears, which then turn the shaft, which rotate the screw. Just one shaft in this early version of the design. Apparently the design of the stern was chosen for aesthetic reasons. Hatches there above the engine and you can see the cables for controlling the off-center rudder. And here's another surviving bit of his kit. A big wheel housed at the back drives these gears which rotate a shaft very fast and then through this little window he could study and photograph the cavitation caused by that little screw as it circulated water in a closed loop. They've installed a transparent section in the side so that we can see the engine in place. I'm not entirely sure, but I assume that these thickish green tubes held together with a very large number of big bolts house the turbines. They line up with the screw shafts. The big red box is the boiler. The shafts are pitched downward at quite an angle. I imagine that this is in effort to keep the bow down when going at speed. I think that's far enough away for copyright. Yeah. Don't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, so. yeah, yeah reckon. Sponsor time. Ah, oh, HMS Nelson, one of the best. Now, I did say that this was a sponsored video, and it is. This has been sponsored very kindly by World of Warships. What's World of Warships? Some of you will be asking. Well, it's, an, it's a game that you can play online. You can download it for free. It's a free to download, free to play game. Yes, you can pay extra for extra twiddly bits, but at heart, it's a free game. Uh, and you play uh, as a captain of a ship, uh, as part of a team against another team of people who are scattered all around the world, and they're controlling uh, their ships from the comforts of their living room 
room and bedrooms. Um, you get to play one of over 200 ships and you can make all sorts of improvements to the ships. If you've played uh, World of Tanks, then it's the same sort of thing, really. It's uh, run by the same company and it works in a pretty similar way. So it's got a, a fairly uh, easy, to, easy to steer ship with left and right and, and a few different speeds forwards and backwards. And then you've got to aim your guns and try to work out how much to lead your moving target by so that your, sh your shells, which you see arcing away quite slowly towards the enemy, uh, will they hit? And you've got uh, torpedoes as well. To, to, to launch. Now, if you uh, download and enter the promotional code Lindy Beige, all in block capitals, please, because it is case sensitive, then you will get $20 worth of in game stuff, including the ship Diana and uh, one week of premium time and 500 doubloons. Yes, doubloons, that's the in game currency uh, to spend on ship improvements and, and better ammunition and, you know, stuff. Stuff that you don't really need, but, you know, stuff that's always helpful. Uh, so, uh, that's one thing you can do. You go to the link in the description and you can give it a go. I've been giving it a go and, um, uh, yeah, I, I like it. It's very pretty, of course. You've got lovely shimmering light effects off the waves. And uh, I do enjoy um, ch ch watching the arc of my shells go towards the enemy and trying to work out where I should be firing in order to, to hit the thing. And you've got uh, torpedoes, which I've been experimenting with. Uh, they're quite difficult to use, but then that's the point. Uh, but when they hit by crazy, they are devastating. Uh, right, so there you go. World of Warships. Enemy battleships sunk. Problem solved, sir. Now, some advances in technology are slow and incremental, whilst others are fast and revolutionary. And the steam turbine engines, as demonstrated by the Turbinia, was definitely an example of the fast and the revolutionary. Now, the Royal Navy had been improving ship design over the previous century by slow increments, of course. Uh, during the Napoleonic Wars, however, it didn't really have to put much effort in because uh, the Royal Navy was capturing enemy ships at such an astonishing rate that the Admiralty had no interest in buying the designs off the, the, the Royal Navy's own super high-tech naval architects uh, because, well, what was the point? It was much quicker, cheaper, and uh, easier, frankly, to just get a load more ships off the enemy. So the, uh, the Royal Navy didn't have to invest in the building and designing of new ships. But after the Napoleonic Wars, that particular source of uh, new shipping, uh, well, it tailed off slightly. Uh, but technology continued to advance, and it was by the 1830s, which is not that much later, that screws were being used to propel ships through the water. Uh, by the 1860s, they started putting all iron hulls on ships. And by 1897, uh, the Royal Navy looked like this. This is the 1897 uh, Spithead Review, and you'll see that they have quite modern-looking uh, hulls. Those are big iron hulls, so that's quite high-tech. But look, they've still got masts. They're still essentially tall ships. Uh, when they went for long journeys, they were sailing vessels. Yes, they would turn on their engines to get out of port, particularly if the, the winds were adverse, uh, so they could get out there, but then they would unfurl their sailing their sails for the long journey. During battle, of course, they could afford the coal, uh, and uh, they, they could then maneuver in, in all sorts of ways that sailing uh, would make difficult to defeat the enemy, but that's a short-term thing. Long-term, for patrolling around the world, which is what you need to do with a big, powerful Royal Navy, um, they were mainly sailing vessels because the, the engines were so inefficient, they couldn't afford the coal. They couldn't carry the coal that could get them all the way around the, the, the world several times over on patrol for the enemy, wherever he is. But after the more efficient uh, engines, as demonstrated in the Tabinia, came in, then that became a possibility, and naval ships could lose their masts. They then had loads more deck spaces, uh, which, where you could swing huge gun turrets without fear of hitting one of those masts. And so it was possible to come up with uh, better and more efficient uh, huge gun turrets on naval vessels, which could then blow the enemy out of the water. Now, the Tabinia was built in 1894. It was demonstrated and convinced the Admiralty in 1897. And just two years later, in 1899, the first two warships driven by uh, steam turbine engines, HMS's Cobra and Viper, were finished. That's right. It went from, yeah, we think this is a good idea, to two warships actually in the water and in service in two years. So the idea that the Admiralty was slow and stuffy and conservative, which is very often said when people are telling the story of the Tabinia, is just not true. And I'm going to carry on talking over this chap here because this is like take umpteenth and I'm, you're just going to have to put up with me talking over some more noise. Now, the, the speed of this revolution is quite extraordinary. Uh, by 1905, just think, 1905, that's only, what, seven or eight years after the, 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 the Spithead Review, the Admiralty declared that from now on all Royal Navy ships will be driven by these engines. So 
That's how quick it was. When World War I started, that's 1914, that's you know, just a decade and a half or so later, the whole fleet was, uh, was powered that way. So it's a tremendous advance. So you could say it was a great feather in the cap of the Royal Navy. Huzzah for the Royal Navy because we've got the latest high-tech ships and we're the best and the biggest, but no, actually, no. Um, my history teacher, uh, teaching me A-level history, described uh, the building of HMS Dreadnought in 1908 as a massive own goal for the British. You may think, well, surely having the Dreadnought, Dreadnought literally fears nothing, a word which now has become, it means a stupendously powerful ship. That word strikes terror into the enemy, you might think, and it did for two whole years. There's two whole years the Dreadnought really Need, needed to dread not. It could blow anything out of the water. It had batteries of 12-inch guns. Can you imagine? 12-inch guns, and it had loads of them on big turrets that could point in any direction. Nothing could catch it. Nothing could hurt it. And even if it could get within range of it, nothing could survive being blown out of the water by it. It could take on anything. So you might think, well, there you go. That's wonderful for the Royal Navy. No, because since 1889, the Royal Navy had been operating what was called the two-power standard. That is a policy that the Navy would be maintained such that it could be confident of beating the next two biggest fleets in the entire world combined. They thought, what's the worst thing that could possibly happen? Well, what if the French allied with the Russians, they were the two biggest fleets at the time, and then went to war with us? Could we take them on? Well, the Royal Navy wanted to be confident of being able to do just that, and they could. It wasn't just the best navy, it was also the biggest. So, terrific, you'd think. And it would be foolish of the French and the Russians to enter an arms race with the British, because don't forget that at that time, the British were far and away the richest country on earth. So to enter an arms race with them would be A, futile because you'd lose, and B, incredibly costly. So this was an excellent policy, you might think, until they built the Dreadnought, because the Dreadnought, at a stroke, rendered all the fleets of the world completely obsolete including the rest of the Royal Navy. All some other country had to do, and it was Germany that gave it a go, was build a new battleship for every one that the British built. And so by the start of World War I, the Germans actually felt confident enough to take on the Royal Navy. And there was the biggest ever naval battle in the Battle of Jutland. And admittedly, the Germans didn't win, but they, they gave the, the British a pretty tough time. The British sh perhaps should have won, but they made a few mistakes. Never mind. Um, it was indecisive, and for the rest of the war, yes, the German Navy was holed up in harbor and didn't really do a lot, but it showed you just how it was possible now for some other power to catch up with the British really quickly. So sometimes inventing the latest stuff is not necessarily to your advantage. In one century, they went from this wooden sailing ship to paddle boats, to this pre-dreadnought, it's iron-hulled, but it's still a masted tall ship, to this. One of my favourite exhibits here is the enormous model of Tyneside in 1929. The power station there, the famous bridges. East of the city of Newcastle, along the Tyne, are shipyards, many shipyards, mile after mile of slipways and dry docks. Hundreds of ships were under construction at any one time and they built them fast. Look, there's HMS Nelson, the most powerful battleship of her day. If you liked ship launching ceremonies, this was a good place to live, as there were a couple of those every day. Along this river, and others like it in Britain, the Clyde, Mersey and Avon, 80% of the world's shipping was once built, and 25% of world trade used British ports. Now the British make less than 1% of the world's ships. There's the Mauritania and the Southampton Floating Harbour. Even the funfair ride is boat themed. And here is one of those first two steam turbine driven warships, HMS Viper. It's only a model. Shh. This is a diesel engine from 1964 a Dobson engine. It is big. How big? Well, that's a staircase, and that's a man. Like I said, big. 
So, if you want to see the Turbinia, you need to get yourself to the Discovery Museum in Newcastle upon Tyne. And whilst you're here, you can see their other exhibits. Uh, they've got uh, exhibits on the cavalry regiments from the northeast. And of course, don't forget that Newcastle is the home of the light bulb because it was, it was Swan who invented the tungsten filament and started manufacturing modern light bulbs for the first time in Benwell. Hmm, light bulbs. But wait a minute, didn't I say that this uh, vessel also revolutionized electrical power generation? Well, thank you for reminding me. Yes, I did. You see, even today, almost all power all around the world, electrical power that is, is generated using steam turbine engines. Now you might think, oh no, surely they're not using old fashioned engines like they were using at the end of the 19th century. Well, yes, actually, even in a nuclear power station, though nuclear power is being used to heat the water and boil it and create the steam, it then goes through a steam turbine. It goes through one of these. Thanks, Mr. Parsons.